it's your boy, the one and only Sir Patrick of the Department of Biology. Welcome to Lecture 7, Asiation. So first we'll have the outline of our lecture for today. The first part of our lecture includes the review of your geologic time scale, deep time. Then we'll move on to the causes of glaciation. Next, we'll dwell with the effects of glaciation. And then we'll briefly discuss the Philippines in the Pleistocene time. So, let's first go to the review of your geologic time or what we call deep time. So in this section, remember your Geology 11 lectures where you talked about what we call TA or Kilo Annum, which means just thousands of years. We also have your MA or, so let's put it here, Kilo, we have the Mega Annum. So we are talking about thousands of years here. When we talk about Mega Anum, we are talking about millions of years. And when we say Giga Anum or your GA, <clears throat> we are then talking about billions of years. So one, two, three. Nine zeros. Yep. So we have Kilo Anum. Mega Anum and Giga Anum. So these are the units that we use in deep time. But um, most of the time uh, for the discussion of glaciation, we'll be uh, dealing with these two units right here, your Mega Anum and Kilo Anum. Okay, million years ago or billion years ago, uh, thousand years ago. So your, let's uh, erase this here. So your geologic time scale is essentially the history of the Earth that is broken up into hierarchical sets of division for, well, describing the deep time. We're not talking about just simple time here that we humans are familiar with. We are talking about deep time or your geological time. And these units, these hierarchical clustering units that you, re you took up in your Geology 11 class is broken down into what we call this includes your eons this includes your era this includes your period epoch and your age okay so eons let's first start with your eons so eons are the largest interval units in the geologic time scale it is divided up into at least four eons as we all know this includes your panerozoic Okay, you also have your Potorizo, we have your Archean and your Hadian uh, eons, okay? So it is divided into four, Panerozoic, Proterozoic, Archean, and Hadian eons. Okay, so uh, for this discussion, we're not be going into details of what are those uh, periods all about what uh, significant geologic events happen in those uh, periods, in those, um, I mean, in those clusters, in those eons, no? yung mga, mga ganyan. But uh, we'll just be focusing on what we need for this discussion. Okay, so, yep. So we have Panerozoic, and the rest is also known as your Precambrian, Precambrian diba? So collectively, the Hadian, Archean, and Proterozoic, remember, is called the Precambrian. <clears throat> okay, so moving on, uh, after your eons, so uh, we zoom in again, we are now going to divide the eons in what we call different eras. So eons are further subdivided into what we call the eras. So for example, your Panerozoic eon is divided up into at least three eras. We have your Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and your Paleozoic era. Okay? Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and your Paleozoic era. 
Moving on, your eras are then subdivided into what we call periods. For example, your Cenozoic era is divided into your Paleogene, Neogene, and the Quaternary periods. Your periods, again, was divided into what we call epoch, into smaller units called epoch. For example, Paleogene here is divided into the Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene epoch, while your Neogene is divided into your Miocene and your Pliocene epoch while Quaternary is divided into the Pleistocene and the Holocene um, epoch. So our current epoch that is, current, is currently still being debated. Are we now in the Anthropocene epoch? So that was my main question to you in the forum discussion. Are we in the Anthropocene? Or is it right to call it the Anthropocene epoch? So yeah, it, if, uh, up until now, it's still currently up for debate. Scientists are still debating on whether to call it the Anthropocene Epoch. Okay, <clears throat> after your Holocene. So uh, after your Epoch, it's again uh, subdivided into what we call ages. So we also have the ages right here. So yeah. So after your epoch, it will also be divided into ages, and uh, but I don't want you guys to be mindful of that. But I want you guys to look at this time interval in arbitrary way. So uh, if you look at these time intervals right here, they don't mean an exact partitioning. What I mean by that is that these time intervals are not equal in length, like hours in your days or minutes in your hours <laughs> no so yeah they are not equal in length they are, are somewhat arbitrary in that sense but i want you guys to think that these time intervals are variable so these time intervals right here are variable in length no? some are shorter than others some are relatively longer than the others Note that the, that the longer intervals can be generally found in your most of the Precambrian period, including your after no? or before your Panerozoic um, eon. Okay, so yeah, the Precambrian is definitely much longer than your Panerozoic, but uh, we have more data on the Panerozoic. That's why we have more subdivisions on that area compared to your, for example, in your Hadian era, right? Um, Hadian eon right there. Okay. So yeah, because with uh, these time scales based on your rock, uh, the rock strata or the rock evidences that your geologists found. Uh, again, remember your geology 11 lectures. All of the methods are discussed there, so I won't even bother repeating them here. Okay? Uh, yeah, during the Precambrian or during the Hadian, Eon, and Proterozoic, and your Paleozoic, yeah, during those times, no? the Archean, the Proterozoic, uh, less and less information, uh, we have less and less information on the significant events that happened there. So that's how your geologic time scale work. And this uh, chart right here is your international, is <clears throat> this geologic time scale, GTS right here, is done by the International Commission on Stratigraphy, Stratigraphy, and this is G this GTS, this geologic time scale right here, is the standard uh, GTS that is used by all geologists all around the world for a more uniform uh, reporting of your time periods that happened during the geologic time events back then. Okay, so yeah, this geologic time scale here is arbitrary in the sense that uh, this ge geologic time is divided using not the length of that area or not the length of that event, uh, that year that that period no but it is divided uh, using significant events that occurred in the history of the earth for example 
uh, when did that mass extinction happen? No? Extinction happened during the Permian, the glacial cycles, or for example, um, well, what other? You want dinosaurs, no? Mga ganon. Or when did the first angiosperms emerge? Mga ganon. Yung uh, usually ginagamit na pang demarcate ng mga boundaries ng ating geological time scale. At alam kong uh, natatandaan nyo pa yan from your Geology 11 lectures. I hope. Hopefully natatandaan nyo. Now, I want you guys to focus in our time period right now. So from the Cenozoic era, and more specifically in your Pliocene, Pleistocene, and the Holocene epoch. So from the, we are currently now, we are currently living. So our geological period is the Quaternary. This uh, geological period is characterized by your massive glaciation, vice, vast, very vast ice sheets that covers your Arctic, uh, that covers uh, from your that covers the entire Europe or well almost the entirety of Europe plus your Northern America your well all of the Canadians there bye bye <laughs> I mean they are covered in ice sheets back then well way way back then but yeah right now the current now now is a brief interglacial phase where we are in a relatively summery period of um, state of our earth no where your glaciers have retreated but these this interglacial periods as we call it <clears throat> interglacial periods are usually very short-lived um, if you look at the past records of events uh, during the earth's climate shift the, it is characterized by a very short, warm periods, and uh, followed by very, very long periods of freaking coldness. So, but yeah, uh, right now in the Holocene slash Anthropocene, so depende pa sa mga scientists natin kung mapag-decide na, na nilang tawagin siyang um, Anthropocene. But yeah, right now we are living in the interglacial the warm interglacial periods uh, most of our history is of the very warm holocene era or epoch i mean that began around 11,000 years ago where temperature rose and your glaciers uh, uh retreated and uh, your woolly mammoths migrated to the north and in these warm periods humans have thrive your agriculture no? uh, there's plenty of rice to go around plenty of um what other plants do we plant for agriculture <laughs> vegetable garden <laughs> um so yeah in this very warm period agriculture arise and with agriculture comes your cities your technologies more people all of our recorded histories uh, all of our recorded histories that we remember is of the Holocene epoch. It's a very uh, short-lived uh, period, actually. But the, the next one that I want you guys to look at here is your Pliocene epoch. Your Pliocene epoch, um, well, it's, it's the second of the two major worldwide division of your neogene uh, period okay uh, the first one is your miocene then your pleiocene so it, it spans from the interval of 5.3 million to 26 um 26 2.6 i mean 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago but uh, the pleiocene follows your miocene epoch that is around 23 to 5.3 million years ago and it is it is very weird because in your Pliocene era, in the Pliocene epoch, it is characterized by, well, generally colder and drier periods than your preceding epochs as revealed by uh, scientific data. And during the Pliocene, you know, so during this portion, uh, there are 
the cycles of ice age that happens. But in the Pliocene uh, period, um, most advanced primates continued to evolve. Uh, for example, your Australopithecensis evolved during the Pliocene uh, epoch or appeared early in that epoch. And there is a burst of particularly rapid evolutionary change and diversification of primates during the Pliocene events. Your African mammals may have occurred during the 2.5 million years ago in the boundary of your Pliocene and the Pleistocene, possibly connected no, to, to the glaciers that uh, happened during the Pleistocene time. But yeah, other terrestrial mammals, including your slots, slots, <laughs> your glyptodons, your uh, armadillo-like armored animals, your opossums, the porcupines, appear late in the Pliocene fossil records of your North America. So, yeah. But then, after your Pliocene, uh, the most, I mean, one of the important events uh, in the history of the planet happened. So, uh, th this comes now your Pleistocene. Okay, the Pleistocene epoch, where your uh, last ice age occurred, yung movie na ice age ay janayare sa Pleistocene uh, epoch. Okay ba? And during the Pleistocene, we see glaciation that happens, the growth of large ice sheets, large ice caps along valleys was the most significant event in the Pleistocene, during which uh, during those times, extensive glaciation of more than 45 million square kilometers uh, cover about 30% of the Earth's land area. So uh, the Earth was almost covered, was covered by glacier and a portion most of, most, essentially most of your, and I want you to take note of this, most of your uh, northern hemisphere, especially the northern hemisphere, has vast, large ice sheets that almost extended even into your middle latitude right here. Even extending to China, covering uh, most of Europe. And, syempre, andyan yung Mount Everest, umaabot dyan yung uh, ice, ice sheets usually. At syempre, kung pumunta ka sa Amerika, pati yung mga lar Great Lakes ng American continent and ng Canada, ng northern can ng southern Canada at northern America ay yung mga great lakes lakes natin ay almost covered ng um, vast ice sheets no uh, tawag namin doon ay North American Laurentide ice sheets that uh, uh, extended no, no? Uh, from the Canadian Rocky Mountains to Nova Scotia to Newfoundland of the east to southern Illinois on the south of the Canadian Arctic on the north, no? <clears throat> and uh, other major ice sheets back then was in North America. Uh, the Cordilleran ice sheet was formed from the mountainous region of from the western Alaska to Washington. Uh, but yeah, glaciers and ice caps were more widespread, not just in the uh, northern part of uh, the northern hemisphere, but also in mountain tops. In usually in mountainous areas like in the United States, the Mexico, yung California, no, and in Alaska and in Canada, uh, ice sheets were also massive. And even in your here in uh, South America, no, and in your New Zealand, right there, uh, where there are high elevation areas, especially in the Andean Mountains, right here. Uh, where there are high elevation areas, usually glaciers are formed. So yeah, I want you guys to realize that. And uh, you know, almost the entirety of, uh, if you look at this, look at this area, almost the entirety of Great Britain is covered in ice, in snow and ice, ice sheets. They're gone. And of course, we have your Arctic Oceans um, right there. And uh, most of your Asian continents, the glaciers in the Asian continent, is uh, located in the roof of the world, what we call the roof of the world, uh, in your 
kung nasaan nakikita natin si yung Chinese, hindi nga ba natin alam kung Tibetan or Chinese Mount Everest na pinag-aagawan pa rin. Pati ng India, no? Sumasama na din doon. At yeah, nakai Mount Everest siya. Usually, yung mga, liki, yung, mga, yung mga glaciers in the Asian continent. So yeah, uh, during the Ice Ages, um, most of the Earth is covered in ice, of course. Ay, kaya nga siya tinawag na Ice Age. But that's the, the main thing that I want you to remember here is that one, uh, most of the ice is concentrated in your northern hemisphere. And that two, the location of mountains are important for the formation of your ice. And that three, the placement of continents are also important in the formation of your ice sheets or your glaciers. Okay, so that's the main thing that I want you guys to remember. But yeah, I don't I don't want you guys to remember where all of the ice sheets were. Uh, you can search that uh, definitely in Google. Napadali lang naman. But yeah, these are the main uh, points that you need to see in the formation of ice sheets during the Pleistocene. That yeah, uh, it's mostly in the northern hemisphere in the mountainous region in the alps and you need to look at the continents to see where the where the glaciers or the ice caps are forming because they have some effect that we will see later on in the video so what are the causes now we'll move to the causes of glaciation there are at least four causes of glaciation. I summarized it into four causes. We have the number one, the Earth's complex orbit. Orbit. So the first one is based on the, well, uh, uh, if you remember our first lecture, I mean the second lecture on physical parameters, we know that, uh, we know that the variation of solar irradiation is important. We also uh, remember this by the name of insulation remember so remember insulation from our lecture when we say insulation this is the measure of the solar energy the incident solar energy on a specific area over some time and there is when there is a variation in that solar radiation that that surface area that that portion of your earth is receiving when there's variation in solar insulation in insulation you get uh you get differential heating and with the, the that differential heating of your earth that causes of course glaciation <laughs> and that variation in solar irradiation is due mostly to the earth's complex orbit and if you go back to the required video video in our VLE core site you will see uh, the discussion on that now the next one right here is the variation in atmospheric properties that reflect or absorb that solar irradiation again we're focusing on solar irradiation but now we are mentioning the the ability of that various uh, atmospheric properties that can reflect or absorb solar radiation so for here we will mention co2 as a main factor so co2 is a main factor uh if you remember greenhouse effect uh, and if you remember venus that's how it gets uh, that's why venus is the hottest planet in the solar system because of the greenhouse effect and that's the main factor uh, that scientists are currently thinking of uh, that's the main cause of glaciation and the main cause of uh, that the main uh, trigger or the main uh, ways to maintain the temperature of the earth so the level of co2 when you have high level of co2 of course there is a greenhouse effect and therefore warm you experience a warmer or a hotter climate and when you <clears throat> have a lower co2 level you then now experience what we call 
uh, cold or glacial event or glacial max you experience glacial maxima for example and of course why do we include volcanoes here because volcanoes are the spewers of well when if you remember the time when a massive volcano erupted for hundreds of years and the uh, the resulting spew of that volcano covered the entirety of the earth's uh, atmosphere therefore blanketing us in <laughs> in para uh, siyang black blanket na hindi maapasok yung light tapos lum ng nagkosyo ng global cooling no so yeah volcanoes can do that and that's how it can also cause uh, global cooling uh, not just your co2 level <clears throat> so your co2 level here uh, of course there are natural controls of uh, in in, the, in terms of the earth climate there are natural controllers or natural mechanism of how we uh, control the amount of co2 in the atmosphere so your ocean can take up co2s your plants your phytoplanktons can take up co2s and embed it in the oceanic floor but then humans can also burn that co2 extract that co2 from the ocean floor from the petrols you know, from our cars can also do that so yeah so yeah both natural and uh, anthropogenic okay so the next uh, factor that causes uh, glaciation here that i will also mention is the earth's surface properties this includes your soil vegetation cover snow uh, cover and the amount of water or how that body of water is also arranged can also affect and can also cause glaciation event now i want you guys to uh, pin in your head uh snow right here okay we'll talk about that later next is your plate tectonics now plate tectonics also uh, contributes to the to, to glaciation in the in the philippines in the world no the uh, most specifically i want you guys to look at the arrangement and the location of the continents as a main cause as a well that could contribute no in the formation of ice in earth in the earth okay now let's uh, talk about them in a more detailed fashion now the first one that we'll discuss right here is the variation uh, in solar radiation radiation this is also known as your insulation so how does the rotation or the changes in earth's motion um, affects the intensity and the distribution of sunlight in the earth's surface so how does it affect that so so how does solar irradiation is caused by what we now call the milankovitch cycle so i want you guys to watch this video right here and it is also pinned in our it's also in our VLE course site. You can watch it there. So this video right here talks about the Milankovitch cycle. So the Milankovitch cycle is you know, was for, was postulated by the Mil Milutin Milankovitch. He's a Serbian scientist. He's a guy that theorizes that these changes in well, certain changes in Earth's orbit might be responsible for the long-term climate change or long-term climate effect or these climate cycles that we see in the ice ages during the Pleistocene time. So uh, if we have that certain uh, change in Earth's rotation or change in, the, in that uh, Earth's orbit, we get ice age or we can also get interglacial period. We can get extreme weather or a mild milder weather no so that's your milankovitch cycles so basically i want you guys to in that uh video uh he talks about uh, at least three uh processes that uh, affects the uh, so these three processes are actually in cycles uh, so we have your eccentricity we have axial tilt or your obliquity so eccentricity obliquity and your third one your precession okay so your eccentricity basically talks about your 
the circularity or the ellipticality, no? ellipticalness of your Earth's orbit. So if it's uh, circular, if the Earth's orbit is a more or less circular orbit, um, you get a hotter climate. Ba kasi mas malapit ka dun sa araw. If you have a more elliptical, syempre exaggerated tong drawing ko dito, elliptical all orbit kung saan mas maano yung mga uphill yung portion mo dyan, mas malayo sa araw, you get a colder climate. No? Uh, obliquity, on the other hand, talks about the change in tilt, no? the tilt of your um, earth, the tilt of the earth. So, obliquity talks about the changes in the uh, tilt of your, the actual tilt of the earth. So, basically, he says that there are, there is a cycle, no? where your obliquity or the actual tilt of the earth in its axis changes from 22.1 degrees so it varies from 22 to 24.5 no in extreme so of course your uh, <clears throat> 22.1 degrees tilt would produce a much colder colder um climate but uh, the um, extreme 24.5 tilt could produce extreme seasons naman. Extreme hot or extreme cold too. Okay, so that's your HL tilt. Uh, but yeah, the next one is your precision. Uh, precession. So precession is essentially the pointing of the Earth's axis at is as, as it rotates. No? And... Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, in the precession portion, I want you guys to imagine that your Earth's uh, point or the Earth's uh, axis also rotates or what we call precess as it's said in that uh, video. So, when we say precession, it's essentially the change in the orientation of the rotational axis of your rotating body. So, uh, yeah. So, that's your precession. So, not just in the axis of your uh, Earth, but also in the long axis of the Earth's elliptical orbit. It also precesses. Okay, so um, uh, when we say precession, we are talking about the wobble. No? Wobble, wobble base, no? wobble, wobble, wobble of the Earth's axis. And all of this, the precession, your obliquity, and the eccentricity, has what we call cycles. So your precession, precession, precession has a more or less uh, cycle, no? has a, has a cycle of uh, 21,000 years, <coughs> 21,000 year cycle. Your actual tilt, naman, or your obliquity also has a cycle. Uh, ito naman a 41,000 year cycle where uh, on the one side, the Earth tilts at 22.1 and at the extreme, the Earth tilts at 24.5, okay? So that takes about 41 uh, years to complete that, uh, that tilt, the change in that tilt, uh, in that obliquity. Now, the last one, this one is a bit um, longer, it's a bit longer. It's a 100,000 year cycle. But... <clears throat> Uh, this one is also divided, this also has a more grander 400,000 year cycle, no? as you have uh, seen in that video. So, my cycle pa yan na mas ma grand at mas mahaba na 400,000 uh, year cycle. <clears throat> okay? So, yeah, 100,000 years, 41,000 years, 21,000 year cycles yung mga meron tayo dito. <clears throat> so, yung iba nga, ano eh? Instead of 21,000, uh, 19, 19 to, to 23 years yung nilalagay nila dito. Kasi may dalawa kang uh, nakikitang changes dito. Dun sa long axis ng Earth, no? nung wobble ng Earth, at dun sa mismong axis na wobble niya, sa precision niya, precession niya, I mean. <clears throat> so collectively, um, I want you guys to imagine that these cycles, and if you watch the video, you can see that these cycles can, would correspond to that cycle of ice age that we see. No? So these uh, 
variation in the or these changes in the Earth's orbit in terms of its eccentricity, in terms of in terms of its obliquity, and in terms of the wobble, in terms of the precession, no, in terms of precession, you can uh, when you combine all of that, you can create a cyclic pattern in ice age, in the ice ages, in the ice cover that the Earth is experiencing. No? So basically, uh, the Pleistocene climate um, is, is have resulted no, in, in the large-scale the large -scale continental ice sheets that we see uh, may have resulted from these astronomical um, changes that the Earth's orbit undergoes as it uh, revolves around the sun. No? No. <clears throat> so this, it, this affects how, of course, solar irradiation is di distributed across the surface of the planet and therefore causes your season, not just your season, but how extreme that season is too. Okay? So, yeah. But, but the, this astronomical theory, the Milankovitch cycle, is not the only one that causes glaciation no although these planetary orbital cycle cycles are the likely cause of the pleistocene uh, climate shifts the pleistocene climate uh, ice ages cycles no the mechanism and the connection to our current global climate are not that simple and not that fully understood there are more important questions that are left unanswered. So this uh, relatively small seasonal and latitudinal radiation variation alone cannot account actually for the magnitude of the climate change that our Earth is experiencing during the Pleistocene time. Clearly, there are some feedback mechanisms that must operate to maybe amplify that insulation change you know, that is caused by these three orbital parameters of your uh, of the earth no? so maybe there are more you no know, there are more feedback mechanism that underlies the glacial patterns you no know, and how uh, extreme that glacial ice sheets uh, may occur so <clears throat> what are those what are those what are those? <laughs> so scientists are now considering the carbon dioxide, you know, the atmospheric uh, changes as a main, as a major factor in uh, causing glacial events, glacial maxima and glacial minima. So this is uh, most uh, importantly your carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere during uh, is uh, the one to blame, you know, during times of glaciation. So um, scientists, uh, from the video too, scientists have uh, uh, extracted ice cores from large glacial sheets uh, and measured the amounts of uh, bubbles, no? the bubbles of the oxygen and carbon dioxide. No? And they've seen that there are certain variation in atmospheric carbon dioxide that are essentially synchronous with the global climatic change and thus may have played a likelihood role you know, that may have played a significant role during uh, the these uh, uh, climatic shifts these ice ages that we have seen uh, particularly this is the greenhouse effect that may have caused uh, a little bit of warming uh, during that time no <clears throat> So this is the phenomenon that, of course, all you know, all of you know this: the trapping of the heat um, due to that greenhouse gases. And of course, the lower the level of your carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, the greater the chances of your glacial maxima to occur, or the formation of glacial ice sheets would be certain when there is a lower carbon dioxide that would trap the heat in the atmosphere when there's lower greenhouse gases. So another one is the aside from that is your dust, no? Uh, for example, volcanic dust that may have increased the uh, covering of your uh, of the atmosphere, and would of course increase the cooling during the glacial times, and <clears throat> and yeah, no, increase cooling during the, that time. 
So all of this may have a uh, further uh, effect, uh, further affect the natural orbital cycles, the Milankovitch cycles, the pattern that the Milankovitch cycles uh, predicts. No? The next one that I want to mention here is uh, what we call the albedo effect. So, so this is another um, important factor for co to consider when we talk about glaciers. The albedo effect. Pag sinabi natin albedo, di ba kung kung nananod yan ng benten, no? pag may albedo usually yan yung amount of light, di ba si albedo. Kaya name lang yun ng character don. But yeah, when you say albedo it's the reflectivity no of the amount of light reflected by the earth's surface parang ganun lang yan no <coughs> so bakit natin pinag-usapan yung albedo kasi pag kinumpare mo kunwari ang ice cover sa for example concrete no ayan may road concrete paved cities ka may mga buildings no pag kinumpare mo yung amount of light reflected mas mataas dito compared dito mas madami tong inaabsorb na uh, light kesa sa nire-reflect. At may importansya yung uh, radiation na nire-reflect ng snow sheets. Kasi, kapag mas madami kang ice, so, the more the ice, nagkakaroon ka dito ng positive feedback mechanism. Pag meron kang, pag mas madaming ice, so, more ice, ice ice baby, nagkakaroon ka ng mas mataas na albedo, mas madaming nire-reflect na light, at kapag mas madaming nire-reflect na light, mas colder, colder, mas ma mas bababa yung temperature at pag mas mababa yung temp no dadami ulit yung ice tataas ulit yung albedo bababa ulit yung temperature tataas ulit ang ice albedo temperature ice albedo temperature so nagpapositive feedback mechanism siya no kaya mas lalamig ng lalamig kapag nagsimula nang mag-form yung mga ice sheets na yan okay at importante yan, lalo na dun sa northern hemisphere natin na mas madami kang ice sheets. No? Sa nor northern hemisphere natin, mas madaming uh, ice sheets kang makikita. Now, kapag pinumpare mo naman dun sa uh, dito, sa concrete natin, concrete jungle, no? <laughs> New York, concrete jungle. Uh, Siyempre, wala kang ice, mas madami kang concrete. No? Uh, so, pag mas madami yung concrete, mas mababa yung albedo, no concrete. Mababa yung albedo. Tataas yung temp. No? Tataas yung temp. Syempre hindi na yan uh, mag magaano dito, magfi-feedback. But pag tumaas yung temp, pwede siyang mag-feedback dito na bababa yung ice sheets. At kapag mawala yung ice sheets, bababa yung albedo. And then, tataas ulit yung temp. No? And then, mag-feedback ulit yan. Mag-feedback ulit yan doon. Then, bababa ulit ice sheets, albedo, temperature, mag-feedback ulit. No? Nakigets nyo ba? So, yeah. Yun ang problema ng... Um, ng kapag nag-construct nag, uh, tayo na nag-construct ng mga concrete jungle na New York, no? ini-increase natin na ini-increase yung uh, heat island effect at yung, syempre, yung, yung uh, binababa natin yung amount of radiation na mare-reflect natin back. No? Ma parang mas matatrap natin yung solar irradiation. Compared kapag may mga snow tayo na magre-reflect nung uh, extra solar irradiation na nandyan. Kasi di ba puti yung snow na yan. So yeah, may mga feedback mechanism na yan. So the last one that I want to talk about here, so that's your albedo. Uh, the next one is your plate tectonics. So plate tectonics also uh, function, uh, also has a major function in, in bringing about the changes in glacial maxima and glacial minima. So I want you guys to, again, watch the required video in our VLE course site. So this is the so story of the Great American Interchange, and it shows how the shows how the movement of your continent, continent, no, your North America and South America can cause 
well, can cause the changes in the cycle or oceanic, uh, oceanic circulations, no? and in turn can also change, can also alter the course of your uh, biological history. So that's uh, the video that I want you guys to look upon. So essentially, the the banggaan, no? the the clashing of your North American and the South American continent has brought about changes in the circulation of our oceanic currents. So uh, before, yung North America natin, a medyo pangit yung drawing, but yeah, yung North America natin ay hiwalay sa South America. Pero unti-unti sila nagbanggaan. At nung nagdikit na sila, nagkaroon ka na dyan ng, well, South America, yung Caribbean, yung mga, yung mga Florida Keys, no, nandyan, yung mga Miami Heat, yung mga ganon. But yeah, nagkaroon ka na ng South African land bridge dyan, na in turn, wala na yung dating nagmimix na uh, water dito. Tapos, nagkaroon na ng uh, bagong circulatory mechanism yung ocean natin, no? At yung circulatory mechanism, nagkaroon sila ng separate circulatory mechanisms. Yung ocean currents natin. At syempre, nag-cost din yun ng differential cooling at differential heating ng ating mga continents at ng ating oceans din. No? At uh, I want you guys to remember this AMOC right here or the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. So this AMOC, is a ocean uh, thermohyaline circulatory uh, mechanism that keeps kaya 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 mapapansin nyo no pag pumunta kayo sa Europe mainit-init pa rin sa bandang UK sa bandang Belgium sa bandang Benelux region well sa bandang Europe northern Europe usually na dapat mainit na kasi ma ma, ma north na yan di ba mataas na yan uh, latitude na yan but because of the AMOC, the mid Atlantic, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, mainit pa rin yung lugar na yun. So yeah, burahin ko lang ng konti. So yeah, the Great American uh, Interchange that happened back then, uh, well, ang tawag talaga dito ay Gabi. So kaya siya Great American Biotic. Ito yung video, ah. Dun sa ano din natin. But yeah. Great Biotic American Interchange. So, Gabi. Yung tawag sa kanya. Well, Gabi is a dispersal event that happened in North America. So, medyo pangit. And South America. No? Dahil nagkaroon ka ng parang nagbanggaan yung continent yan. Nagkaroon ka ng land bridge na kung saan pwedeng mag-migrate yung mga species dito papunta sa species sa North papunta sa South America. At syempre, yung mga species sa South, pwede din pumunta sa North America. No? So that's your Gabi or the Great American Biotic Interchange. Yun lang naman yung sinasabi ng video. But Gabi or your Great American Biotic Interchange were aided by the development of your Northern Hemisphere Glaciers. So the Northern Hemisphere Glaciation events could have promoted the development of a savanna savanna-like uh, ecosystem in, in South and Central America in contrast to it's now um, well, it's now tropical, di ba? Medyo tropical na yung pag, pag pumunta kayo dyan, di ba? Sa, sa Central America ngayon, dyan sa Florida, sa bandang yung mga Maliliit na bansa na nandito na kinolonize din no Puerto Rico, kinolonize din ng Amerika. Well, yung iba. No? I mean, hindi, hindi colonize na colonize. Yung may Che Guevara, hindi siya colonize lahat. No? Yung, I mean, uh, settled. <laughs> hindi ko alam yung political correct na. Ayan, no? But yeah, <laughs> tropical uh, ecosystem siya ngayon, di ba? Tropical ecosystem siya ngayon. Di ba? Ang ganda ng summer dyan. Madaming banana pa. <laughs> but yeah, tropical yung ecosystem niya ngayon but that before the formation of ice sheets the northern ice sheets could have converted it in a savanna-like ecosystem no? at yung scientist thinks that the 
the conversion of it into a more savanna-like ecology in contrast to its now tropical character could have prim- permitted the the migration, no? the interchange of a more savanna-adapted animals to cross between the North and South American uh, continent. So yeah, now again, the 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 next one that I want you guys to look at here is that the the location of your plate tectonics is very the the location of your continent is is very very important. So how is it important? So if you think about the the continents in general. So there is a relation between continents and ice sheets or more or, or less the location of land mass and ice sheet. There is a certain uh, connection between them. Now, this video right here that I'm showing you here, if you can see right here, look at them. Look at the difference between the north and the South America. The South America. The North and the North Pole and the South Pole. Look at them. If you look at the northern hemisphere of the Earth, there are more land masses compared to your southern hemisphere which, where you can only see one large land mass. And this is the one thing that I want you guys to remember from this lecture that it's very difficult for snow to grow on water. Yeah, it's weird, right? It's very weird. It's a very weird uh, thing. It's a very weird thing. Because snow is water, <laughs> but it, takes, it, it makes it difficult to grow on water because it's water. <laughs> yeah, it, it's more, well, snow finds it difficult to grow on water. That's the main thing here. That's why the presence of land masses in your northern hemisphere have aided in the formation of glacier in northern part of the earth. And if you look at the southern hemisphere, the southern part of the earth, since there are uh, just one land mass right there, and there are no near land masses, well, except for your New Zealand and the southern tip of South America, the glacier finds it, the glacier, the ice sheets and the glaciers find it difficult to grow on the southern hemisphere of the earth. So that's how also plate tectonics affect, okay? That's how plate tectonics can then affect the formation of ice sheets. Okay ba tayo doon? Kapag yung plate tectonics, yung movement ng plates natin, kumawari ay nasa, uh, equator lang. You know? Kung sabihin natin, balik tayo dito sa ating, uh, yeah, sa paper natin. Kung yung mga continents natin, you know, sabihin natin lang na yung mga continents natin ay nasa gitna lang ng equator, mahirapan na mag-form ng ice sheets dun sa North and South Pole. Kasi mas madaling mag-form ng ice kapag may landmass ka. At ganun din naman kapag yung mga landmasses natin ay nasa poles lang, puro ice sheets ka. Mas madali ka mag-form ng ice sheets. So yeah, that's how plate tectonics can affect the formation of uh, glaciers, the formation of ice sheets in general. No? The location of land masses has in turn affected the ice cover that we experience right now. So now that we're done with the causes of glaciation, what are the effects of your glaciation naman? So we have three major effects right here. The first uh, obvious one is your climate, uh, sorry, sea level changes. The next one is your shifting clima climatic zones. The third one is the effects of glaciation to the animals, to the plants, to the flora and fauna. The biogeographic responses or the consequences to life of your glaciers mainly migration extinction and refugia we'll talk about them later let's now focus to the number one sea level changes 
So the most obvious one that uh, can happen due to well glaciation is sea level changes. And we know that when we have glaciers, when we have glaciers or when we have snow and ice caps, we have lower okay we have lower sea levels therefore exposing the what we call therefore creating what we call corridors huh? corridors and barriers so if you compare the before and after the ice age and the now no in your berinja okay ito lagi yung sinasabi ko sa inyo the beringia the beringia in uh, russia and your north america or your alaska no alaska state alaska state of america there is actually a land bridge that exists there before because there are snow there is ice there is lower sea level therefore there is a land bridge where your large mammals and also humans can cross this land bridge and therefore the humans here can colonize no that part of the earth that part of continent when there are when before there are no humans no nung wala pang mga syempre mga bangka nito noon <laughs> hanggang walk lang yung mga ginagawa ng mga mammals mga large mammals and the humans but yeah uh, sea level changes can provide corridors can provide corridors where organisms can cross so para siyang pathway where organism can cross but it can also so that's the positive side it can allow organism to migrate and cross to different areas of the world but it can also create a negative side of it barriers so now that there are no uh, land bridge the, la the beringia is now gone the land bridge is now gone because because of uh, we have melted the ice, so wala na mga ice, wala na mga snow. Therefore, tataas yung sea level ulit. Dahil mataas yung sea level, nawala yung mga exposed dati mga berinja, at nagkaroon ka na ng barrier. No? Nagkakaroon ka ng mga barriers. That's the main causes of sea level changes. So, I want you guys to look at this video right here. So, as you can see here, there are a lot of areas. And if you... There are a lot of areas where there are barriers, there are corridors that are created during the Ice Age time and now, compared to now. There are certain land that are present before, but due to the increase in sea level, they are now gone. And if you look at the Philippines here, as you can see here, the Philippines has uh, more land cover uh, when, uh, well, compared to now before philippines has more land that are exposed we have larger greater luzon we have larger palawan but now they are gone and most of us our islands are now separated and wala nang mga land bridge na exposed dati titingnan niyo din yung lingayan gulf diba may land dun dati ngayon wala na so yeah sea level changes uh are caused by your rising uh well the presence and absence of glaciers and ice and the rising sea level change is caused by the melting or the formation of your uh ice sheets no so yeah again ulitin natin kapag may ice ka alam niyo naman na to lower sea level para klarado lang tayo doon when there's ice, lower sea level. At, at kapag lower sea levels, meron kang mga land masses na may, may exposed. Kapag higher sea level, pwedeng mawala yung mga land masses mo na yun. No? Pwedeng mawala yung mga land mass mo. At yung current predicament ngayon ng mga small island nations at yung mga specific coastal communities natin, kung titignan nyo sa Maldives, sa Pilipinas, no? baka yung Manila mawala na kapag 
or yeah, yung mga coastal cities natin ngayon, lalo na yung sa Ilocandia region, yung mga low-lying areas natin sa Camarines, low-lying areas natin sa Summer and Leyte, low-lying areas natin, lalo na sa NCR, ay lulubog kapag patuloy na patuloy ang pag-melt ng ating mga ice sheets. So, hindi lang tayo sa Pilipinas, pati na yung mga small island nation like Fiji, uh, Hawaii, the American Samoa, no yung Guam, Guam natin, eh, hindi natin, well, uh, Guam ng Amerika, pero madaming Pinoy at Ilocano doon. At yung sa Maldives na isang tropical uh, paradise ay lulubog na din soon. Pati din yung mga coastal uh, communities dito sa Indonesia uh, ay lumulubog din paunti-unti. Yeah, but not just the tropical countries, but also in your Euro- European countries. For example, in your uh, Netherlands. No? Yan yung pinaka-delikadong lumubog kapag patuloy ng pagtaas ng Ice Age. Uh, well, Netherlands is built, is man-made. <laughs> the most... of uh, most of the land cover in Netherlands in Dutch is man-made. No? So parang pinaglilipat lang nila yung lupa, gumawa, nireclaim lang talaga nila yung dagat or yung tubig nun. Uh, so yeah, uh, yan, uh, pinaka-delikado na lumubog ay the Netherlands and the part of Great Britain, UK, lumubog din yan kapag patuloy na pagtaas ng sea level natin. At syempre, yung sa kung titingnan nyo, yung sa South America, South America, yung lalo na yung mga river deltas ng South America, eh, ng South America, sorry, ng USA, no yung bandang south ng USA, yung mga river delta nila, kakainin din yun ng rising sea level. So yeah, sea level changes, creating corridors, creating barriers, creating land mass, and Uh, taking those land masses back into the ocean, taking those land masses back. So that's your number one. The next one is your climate zones. I want you to look at this uh, picture right here. This is your USA. And of course, with changing climate, uh, with changing, um, uh, changing ice sheets, with the climate cycles that we have, with the formation of ice, ice sheets, and then Those ice sheets are now melting. With those changes comes the changes in what we call climatic zones. No? So before, so this is, uh, yeah, you can see here, if you compare these two uh, climate zones right here, uh, the, what, what I want you to see here is that the tropical clim- climatic zone is somehow creeping up. towards the northern part of your American continent. Okay? So it's creeping up towards the northern part of the American continent. Um, and your uh, colder climate zones are receding and receding upwards to the Canadian, uh, um, Canadian countryside and towards the colder, uh, higher latitudinal regions. And with this shift, with this shift in climate, climate zone comes with the shift with your organism that is in that climatic zone that requires that climate, climate that specific climatic zone to live. So the, the species that are well before adapted in this uh, colder climate right here are now being pushed and being forced to migrate to the much better climatic zones for them so they must migrate or they die due to the change in the clim- the shift in the, that climatic zone of course some species are are sensitive some species are not that sensitive in that changes in climatic zones but um, some animals no may be pushed to the brink of uh, extinction due to these shifts in climatic zones uh, no The next one is, uh, in terms naman dun sa mga pest natin, so in terms, terms of pests, in terms of diseases, na before, with the colder climate, the pests are, are located in the lower tropical regions of the world, of the, well, 
for this case in the uh, Americas. Okay. So in this case, if you look at that uh, uh, case right here, so the pest, the the diseases may be localized in the tropical climate. No, but when there is a shift, there is a shift in climate that pest that is once localized in the lower latitude can expand their range towards the higher latitude and then colonize the areas that was not before uh, available to them, extending their uh, region, extending their range. So that's, uh, that's the, the one thing that could also happen uh, when, yeah, di ba, may mga naririnig tayo, tayong attacks ng giant locust, mga mga killer bees, mga pests na dati wala naman sa northern part ng area, but nagkaroon, dahil nagkaroon nga ng climate shifts, ng climatic zone shift, na shift din yung range ng mga pests na yon, no? Towards that upper par portion of the the upper latitude, no? Na dati wala naman sila. Pati din, hindi lang sa pests, pati din sa mga diseases. No? Yung, yung some for the, the diseases that we have, uh, well, not all of them, but some may require certain climatic conditions that may proliferate better in a tropical climate than in your colder climate. So with the changes in the climatic zones, with changes shifting climatic zones, comes that too. No? So may expand din yung... Uh, range ng mga diseases na dating localized lang sa may init na area papunta dun sa mga malalamig na area. So yeah, that's uh, the major problem with the shifting climatic zone. So the main reason why your organism respond to, well, glaciation is because with the changing climate shifts, with changing ice sheet coverage, with the changing uh, climate cycles, with your glacial maxima, glacial minima, to your warm, to your cold cycles, uh, if your glacial periods, comes the changes in the location and the extent, plus the configuration of the habitat in which your organism can rely on. With the, with the glacial periods too, comes your changes in the nature of the climate zones or the environmental zones where that uh, range, the range of that species is reliant on. The one that we uh, explained uh, earlier. Plus, glaciation could also cause the formation and also the opposite dissolution of dispersal routes as we have explained earlier from the formation of your Beringia and the formation of the land bridges. Diba? Or the formation of islands. No? Uh, say for example, before these uh, two island, uh, these two, uh, these two are large mass. But when the uh, temperature rises and the uh, sea level uh, rises too, uh, the the islands are now separated by your oceans that creeped in that um, in that island no so yeah it can form and it can also dissolve those before existing dispersal routes so yeah it's it's it has the positive and the negative side of the coin both the positive and the negative side of the coin so yeah so uh, or your organism can either one migrate due to that changes in all of those or it can sometimes reside in what we call refugia these are like um, regions where uh, your organism no, can remain undisturbed or these are like habitats that are uh, that still remains as as a miniature well, although a much smaller version of its former glory, but still could support the organism. So that's that's your refugia. No? 
for uh, like these are like refugee centers but in terms of your habitats that could house these organism if it cannot migrate and if it cannot find a refugee center your organism can die no and become extinct so it can go extinct so that are those are the major responses of your organism it can migrate it can find a ref refugee center and finally if it can't do any of that it will die and go extinct again remember that the changing environment in response to this climatic variation can cause a drastic drastic disruption in the fl flora and in term in the faunal composition of the land no? this disruption were most of the time greatest near the former ice sheets region no? where the ice sheets extended no? far to the south okay and this can cause uh, changes in the climatic zone and also in the vegetation zone and all we all know that in this climatic zone and in this vegetation zone certain species are reliant upon and when that changes and shifts upward or maybe shifts downward there will it will cause a migration of your species no so say for example your species a single species can change its geographic range no the for example before there is a overlapping geographic range between species b and species a but when there is a change in that climatic variation there's a changing environment and there's this climatic and vegetation ch change upwards to the northern and or to the southern latitude it can create a change in the geographic range of the area and therefore cause migration of your uh, organism so for example here a no can migrate upwards or your b can uh, migrate downwards but the thing here is that these species have different dispersal ability or can tolerate different climatic condition and thus it will create uh, this a uh, pattern of changing no their range overlap due to that uh, differences in dispersal ability so the next uh, example here is at altitudinal migration so it's not it's not just your organism from the uh, lower latitude can migrate upwards or the organism from the higher latitude can migrate downward no due to the changes in climatic variation it's also possible that there could be an altitudinal uh, sense in the migration of entire biomes or migration of species so say for example take this um, picture right here in this figure right here so migration can also be in the altitudinal uh, fashion kumbaga, no? so compare 14,000 to 20,000 years ago and to now no? there are so before the perennial snow cover most of the 50,000 uh, 5,000 sorry 5,000 to almost uh, 3.5 no 3.5 thousand meters no elevation no? so the perennial snow covers that area and then other forest cover are present uh, in the lower region so we have andean forest sub-andean forest we have tropical forest uh, down below and savanna and dry wood tropical woodland in the very low portion but due to the changes in ice cover to the rise in temperature to changing glacial cover of the andean mountain now the perennial snow does not extend downwards to your 3.5 thousand meters but it only covers up to well at most no, your 4.5 to the 5,000 um, meters above sea level na snow 
So snow is only localized in this area. And with that, it could also um, change. No? And it could also uh, allow the organism to creep up and change their range before. So the, the species can now move upwards as they can colonize the areas that don't have uh, snow cover anymore. So entire biomes can migrate not just um, horizontally uh, in terms of latitude, but also altitudinally, no? vertically, kumbaga. Altitudinal. Okay? So, with that too, no? not just the vegetation cover, it can also bring about the species that thrives in that in that uh, temperate forest, for example. So this is also particularly applicable in the Philippine context. You know? So it could also affect the habitat types that we have in the Philippines, from the mossy forest to the lowland forest to the grassland in Pulag. No, pwede ding magkaroon ng changes sa shift niyan due to uh, that climate changes that we experience. So yeah, I want you to realize that species with a particularly lower migration capability had to adapt to the changing environment or else they could die. If they could not adapt to that changing environment, they will die. Therefore, many species uh, faced extinction when they can't migrate. No? Or uh, in if they they don't go extinct, they can remain isolated from other population. And uh, soon and soon, they can uh, produce different species since they are isolated for quite some time you know, from that other population. So it limits the, the, the changes in climatic zones and vegetation cover can also limit how... Uh, how well your organism can be dispersed no? and how well it can uh, migrate. So it limits the connection from one population to another. And that's bad in terms of your, well, in terms of the genetic composition of your organism. But it's not just that, no? Your organism, even though it can migrate, it doesn't guarantee that it could be established or it could persist in that area. Most of the time, when that organism colonizes a new area, it has to face, well, the local organism that thrives in that area that it migrated to. No? So other than that, other than competition, it can also face diseases. No? Or if it is lucky enough, it could coexist. It could coexist with the species that live in the area that it migrated to. Okay? So yeah, so migration in terms of biotic interchanges, remember Gabi. So yeah, that's one of the uh, um, uh, examples. And the Eurasian species that cross the Beringia. Diba? Kung makikita nyo. At pati yung mga tao din, tayo, no? Nag-cross dyan sa Beringia. Ayan. <coughs> so uh, just to give you I'm ah, sorry hindi pa pala. Um, the next one is the formation of what we call refugia or the glacial refugia so these are isolated fragments of non-glaciated land these provided opportunities for the divergence and diversification of species so these glacial refugias are offers no but it offers um the opportunity for some organism to thrive. No? These are fragments, for example, right here, these are fragments no? of areas that still is not glaciated. So in this area, your microorganism, for example, can also thrive without uh, dying from the ice that looms around it. Because uh, maybe that area is a uh, volcanic hotspot or that area has a hot spring. And these provide opportunities for that species to remain uh, living in that refugia right there. 
no? it can provide the opportunity for that um, organism to stay alive and maybe to diverge and diversify um, into different species. No? So, yeah, uh, once your glacier uh, extended, this uh, glacial refugia right here offers that opportunity for some organism to thrive in that uh, cold condition. But when uh, the same is true when that uh, ice sheet retreats and it leaves uh, small pockets of very cold uh, or, or it leaves pockets of uh, waters or glacial water to your, um, uh, well, to your what we call Great Lakes natin, no? Sa bandang Canada at sa bandang uh, North America, no? Yung mga Great Lakes natin dyan. Now, to give you an example of the uh, Pleistocene uh, organism that we have back then, uh, so I want you to look at this uh, example of your Pleistocene megafauna. Okay, so these are some examples of the animals that roamed the Pleistocene epoch, Pleistocene time. So we have your Teratorn, Teratorn is in Credibilis. So these are large birds. Uh, next is your giant bison. So this one right here for a scale, this is a human being. <laughs> so it's a very large uh, <clears throat> horn of the bison latifor latifrons. <clears throat> we also have your ground slot, your megatherium. These are very large slot uh, back then that roamed the planet. Yeah, very large ground slot compared to a uh, normal Santa Claus reindeer. <laughs> so it's a very large ground slot. And di ba, kung maalala nyo dun sa movie Ice Age, maliliit na sila. So nagkaroon sila ng body changes. Yung mga descendants niya later on. But yeah, we have uh, ground, large ground slots, your megatherium. We have your saber-toothed uh, cat. We have, yeah, Smilodon fatalis. Look at that, a uh, very iconic saber-toothed um, cat, no? Yung sa moving, ano nga ba yun? Yung may saber-toothed cat na niligtas niya. Uh -oh. <clears throat> Basta yun, yung movie na yun, di ba? So parang yun yung, ano, yun yung saber-toothed uh, teeth niya. Anyway, we also have your cave bear. Eh, cave bear. Cave bear. So the ur signs are here. Next is your giant deer, Megaloceros, Giganterius, uh, with a very uh, grand um, antler right there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, those are your uh, examples of your uh, organisms that roamed the, the planet during the times where uh, there's a very large ice cover in most of the continents of the world, okay? Now, the last uh, one that could happen is that your organism can face extinction. So if your organism can find a refugee site, if that organism <clears throat> can't find, can't migrate, you know, it could face extinction. So there are certain uh, extinction events that happen. So why, that, that's the main question right here. Why are all of these species, these um, megafaunals, Pleistocene megafaunal species that we see right here that we enumerated uh, kani lang, why are these species became extinct? Diba? It would be cool no, if we see saber-toothed tiger again <laughs> or the uh, large ground sloth. No? Ang gaganda nila. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but there was a megafaunal extinction. So during the end of the Pleistocene was marked by the extinction of many, many, many genera of large mammals, particularly large mammals. Mammals talaga yung, well, kapag uh, sinabi mo asing Pleistocene, no? um, pag uh, Pleistocene, ang major events lang naman dyan, Ice Age at diversification ng mammals. And uh during the latter portion of the Pleistocene, uh 
ay ang major event sa nangyari ay yung extinction ng mga large mammals, the Pleistocene megafauna ang tawag natin. Including your mammoths, your mastodons, your gra- uh, large ground sloths, your giant beavers, your giant bear, cave bears. <clears throat> this extinction event is most distinct usually in the North American region where at least 32 genera of large mammals vanished during uh, an interval of at least 2,000 years. No? So on other continents, uh, fewer genera disappeared and extinction were widespread over a somewhat longer time span kung i-check mo sa ibang <clears throat> continent. But in uh, Northern America, yeah, madaming genera ang nawala talaga. Now, the cause of the extinction events during the late Pleistocene uh, is still vigorously debated until now. There are two main hypotheses being advanced. The first one is the climate-based hypothesis. The next one is the overkill hypothesis. So there are, those are the two main hypotheses that they are proposing that causes the major extinction event, the extinction of the megafauna during the Pleistocene time. So the first one is your climate-based hypothesis. Um, so you can see right here, the climate-based uh, hypothesis is, of course, since it's from the name itself, is climate-based uh, yeah, it mean it means that the extinction were brought about by the abrupt climatic and vegetation changes during the last glacial slash interglacial transition. No. So during the climate uh, base hypothesis, it it suggested that the climatic changes, the increased aridity, and that it could cause the decrease in food source for those large herbivores. So your ground sloth can no longer feed its body weight, and therefore it's gone extinct. No? So these abrupt climatic changes could have caused that extinction. So yeah, so the evidences for supporting the climate-based hypothesis are, number one, uh, climatic changes uh, definitely modified the vegetation and would, in turn, uh, provide less food to large herbivores. And since uh, large mammals are mostly dependent on this food, those large animals are more affected than your smaller animals. So definitely, your uh, megafauna during the Pleistocene time were more um, affected and were more subjected to extinction due to the loss of food compared to your smaller uh, mammals or smaller animals that um, could have resisted more of that food scarcity could have survived that changes but uh, since these are large mammal needs large amount of food to survive and when that food source is gone they'll die due to well the change in uh, vegetation cover okay but there are certain problems with the uh, climate-based hypothesis. Number one being uh, <clears throat> the, that the megafauna that uh, we seen earlier are survivors of actually at least 20 glacial cycles. No? So why is it it's just now that they die? No, bakit ngayon lang? Dati naman, nagkakaroon pa rin ng climate shift. No? Meron kang shifting uh, vegetation cover, merong glacial, then interglacial, glacial, interglacial. 20 cycles of interglacial and glacial cycles no? na na-survive nila. But bakit ngayon lang, no? bakit ngayon sila mamamatay? Eh, eh, dati naman, okay lang sila doon. No? Tapos, kung titignan mo naman yung mga large species sa Africa and Eurasia, hindi naman sila nag-suffer like nung pagsasuffer nung ating mga uh, organism dun sa North American continent. No? Hindi sila katulad na ganun. No? Hindi ganun ka-extreme yung extinction rate ng mga uh, African and Eurasian counterpart compared sa African mega, American megafauna natin. So, yun yung problema na ano. Yung una, yung mga megafauna na to, buhay na sila. Nabubuhay pa rin sila no? kahit merong changes na vegetation. 20 glacial cycles, 
na-survive nila kahit may changes in vegetation cover. At kung titignan mo yung mga African and Eurasian counterpart ng mga yung mga big animals sa Africa and Eurasia, hindi naman sila ganong kalaki yung extinction rate compared dito sa American megafauna natin. So the next hypothesis is your overkill hypothesis. So number two hypothesis. It's, uh, it's, it stems from the fact that humans uh, may have crossed. No? So humans are to blame ka pala. Since humans may have crossed the Beringia from Asia, di ba kung mapapaalala nyo, again yung meron kang Russia, tapos andito yung Alaska, humans may have crossed that Beringia too along with the uh, organisms, no? large organisms. And these humans could have inhabited and could have traversed the entire South and North America. And since humans are smart and they can produce tools, they are uh, formidable, skillful hunters that could uh, hunt down these large bees. So the overkill hypothesis uh, postulates that humans may have overhunted these uh, large megafauna for food source. So there is also what we call naive prey. Naive prey yung tawag sa nila. Kasi nga naman, yung mga large, wari yung ground slots natin, Yung mga yan ay medyo hindi sila exposed sa mga technology ng hunting uh, tools na ginagamit ng humans. So parang madali silang uh, mapatay at mahuli ng mga humans natin. Yung mga humans na currently nag-colonize at nag-cross ng Beringia na yun. No? So yeah, humans are to blame sa overkill hypothesis. Okay? So... Evidences that support the overkill hypothesis are, yes, totoo na yung megafauna natin at yung humans ay nag-coexist to a certain times dun sa mga fossil records na meron tayo. At dun din sa mga fossil records na meron tayo, yes, may mga hunting activities na napatunayan due to the presence of hunting tools, yung mga cave paintings, mga ganyan. No? O yan yung unang patunay na, oo nga. At kung maaalala nyo, yung lecture natin, di ba? Sa migration pattern, oo, nagko-coincide yung time, timeline. Nung pag-cross natin dun sa Beringia dito, ayan, pag-cross natin sa Beringia dyan, papunta dito, sa pag-colonize dito sa North America at sa South America, dun sa time ng pag-exist ng mga uh, ma America, North American megafauna natin. Na, ngayon. Other other examples, uh, other supports for the evidence is that the um, most affected terrestrial animals by the Pleistocene extinction were large herbivores and their predators. So yeah, since in, in, hinahunt natin yung large herbivores na yan at yung predators niya na to ay nagre-rely dun sa food na large herbivores na kinakain nila, uh, it makes sense na sila yung naapektuhan ng Pleistocene extinction na yun. Next is that Few extinction in the Eurasian and the African counterpart because animals coexisted for longer with the hunter, human hunters dun sa area na yun. No? Compared dito sa American counterpart na ngayon ngayon pa lang nagsisimulang mag ano, medyo younger, no? Kumbaga. Compared dun sa African ano, uh, counterparts and sa Eurasian counterparts na yung mga large animals doon matagal-tagal nang nabubuhay with human hunters. So, nakapag-adapt na sila with uh, the humans, uh, migration ng humans. <clears throat> and yung extinction uh, pattern na nakita nila is from the North American towards the South American fashion. Na makes sense kasi mula yung tao dun sa uh, North American Beringia, di ba? Nag-migrate tayo dun sa Russia to the, the Beringia. Tapos, uh, kinolonize muna natin yung north and then unti-unti tayong nag-migrate towards the South American fashion. No? Kaya yan. Yeah. So those are the evidence. Uh, the only problem with the overkill hypothesis is that your hunting skills and technology for your humans, kung, kung titignan mo yung mga fossil records at yung mga technology na meron tayo nun, hindi siya ganun ka, kaganda. No? Wala tayong mga baril pa nun. No? Siguro meron tayong mga pana-pana 
at mga sibat-sibat. Uh, I mean, yung mga tao doon. No? <clears throat> But hindi siya ganun kaganda kung gagamitin mo siya sa sobrang lalaking mga praise. And the only archaeological evidence that mammoths and bisons were killed that, that we have is for your mammoths and bisons. No? Wala, wala dun sa ibang uh, pang mga megafauna na meron. Mammoths at bisons lang. May evidence tayo na inahant ng humans. Okay? Okay ba tayo? So, yun yung unang uh, problema. So, ang solution nila uh, is a more comprehensive explanation to the megafaunal extinction. That is to combine the overkill hypothesis and the climate and environmental changes. So, they combine the two proposal. The climate hypothesis and the overkill hypothesis. That the combination of human factors and environmental changes could in 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 joining together no? <laughs> these two factors could bring about the extinction of this large american megafauna so uh, the fires that we use could have scared this uh, organism away from their food source <clears throat> and with the presence of humans we may have competed with the food sources of these large herbivores And with us, we bring what we call exotic species. Exotic species, your invasive species, plus the diseases that we have, coupled with the hunting that we do, could bring about the death or the extinction of your organisms right here. Okay? So that's your uh, megafauna, American megafauna extinction. The Pleistocene extinction event. Okay, so for the last portion of our lecture, we'll talk about Philippines in the Pleistocene uh, time. Okay, so uh, um, if you look at this uh, picture right here, um, the Pleistocene islands of the Philippines is uh, much different from the islands that the Philippine islands that we see of today. So these Pleistocene islands is more or less aggregated islands, no? So, so kung makikita nyo dito, Samar and Leyte are joined together with your Mindanao, Greater Mindanao. No? You have what we call Greater Sulu here, Greater Palawan here, which are much bigger than uh, what we can see today. So this is the Palawan that we see today, the green one right here. But before it was joined together, We have Greater Luzon, of course, which is much more greater and much more uh, larger than it was um, uh, now. Uh, well, it's much it's much larger now than before. Kumbaga. That's why it's called Greater Luzon. And you also have uh, Greater Negros and Panay. So, yeah, they are joined together, the Negros and Panay. You also have Cebu, Comgin, and so on and so forth. But yeah, during the Pleistocene, Uh, if you use the 150 meter batimet bati batimetric line uh, that you adapted from Heaney 1986, you can you can see no. So ilagay lang natin batimetric. Ibig sabihin lang naman yan, yan yung oceanic ano uh, lines no, yung oceanic map sa baba. So kung sa kaliman na uh, bumaba yung sea level, ganyan yung itsura ng islands nun. So, during the Pleistocene, meron tayo yung tinatawag na, um, ang term na ginagamit natin is the Paik. Or the Pleistocene Aggregated Island Complex Theory. Pleistocene Aggregated, so Pleistocene Aggregation Island Complex Theory. Okay? <clears throat> Or sometimes they call it Paik, or sometimes they call it Pleistocene Aggregation Coalescence Theory. But uh, you, you can just uh, name it Paik here as Pleistocene Aggregated Island Complex. Okay, the Paik Theory. So the Paik Theory <clears throat> is based on the radical speculation back then that uh, 
that that Luzon, the, the Greater Luzon, is a separate separate entity from your <clears throat> Mindanao, the Greater Mindanao. No? That uh, there's that possibility that G Greater Luzon is separate uh, archi archipelagic system uh, from your Mindanao. That's why. Uh, since they are separate arch archipelagic system, you can infer the distribution of modern biota now, which are, so if you look at them, the Greater Luzon and <clears throat> uh, Mindanao uh, before, and you compare the distribution of the species in Greater Luzon and Mindanao today, in Luzon and in Mindanao today, you can see uh, may, you can maybe see a striking similarities or, or dissimilarities between between the two because once they was there they were a separate entity altogether no <clears throat> so yeah the paik theory forms that current basis that current idea that explains the distinctness between the species that you can found in luzon and the species that you can found in mindanao is due to that uh, separation no? that was caused, of course, by your tectonic features of the Philippine archipelagic system back in the Pleistocene time. So the Pike theory, the Pleistocene aggregated island complex theory, is the current paradigm that we use for explaining the origin and the dimension of your biodiversity in the Philippine context. This theory states that the isolation and the reconnection of the islands before, during the Paleo period, during the Pleistocene period, no, we call them not Luzon, we call them not Palawan, we call them the greater islands of the Philippine archipelago. So these <clears throat> Paleo islands, these greater islands of the Philippines, no, this formation of these coalesced islands, no, these coalesced islands right here, may have provided that vicariant mechanism for Okay. <clears throat> okay, but I don't. Also, the differential dispersal abilities of these isolated species on that paleo, paleo island and today could provide that increased genetic isolation that could lead to the speciation in the future. That's why we see that differences in uh, species uh, and the misty. <clears throat> So your pike theory can explain speciation in the Philippine taxa within the last 5 million years. That the, that's why it's not surprising that the pike theory can predict the population in the given island should be more or, more or less related uh, in the population from other islands. Because say for example, uh, lang natin to. <clears throat> so say for example, the islands here and the species that you can see in northern Luzon and in this region or in this region or in this region right here, since before they was once coalesced into just one blob of island, the greater Luzon, if you compare the species that you can see here, here, and here, they more or less look the same, no? Or they should have that certain similarities in the population that is uh, present in them, no? So yeah, population in a given island should be more or less related from population in other islands that were once connected in the Paik no, during the Pleistocene time. <clears throat> the other thing here is that the population within an island should be also genetically related with the similar population in other islands if they were once connected or if they were once coalesced into a greater island. So the species that you can see here, or and the species that you can see here, you can sh you should see an outstanding similarity between their genetic uh, uh, composition. No? They should be more genetically related because the species here and the species here could be once connected before. No, in this white giant one giant blob of islands, your greater uh, Mindanao. That's just intuitive, no? <clears throat> so, with that too, so that's ulitin natin, the number one, uh, population in a given island 
in a given island should be more or less related no if they came from one coalesced island during the Pleistocene number two population within an island should be within an island should be genetically the same or genetically similar <coughs> than similar population on other islands and number three is that monopyletic lineages monopyletic lineages should be found in your islands and not across several islands so yeah kaya uh, yung mga current studies ni Tini at ng mga current bio biogeographers natin makikita mo na for example sa Negros Panay Island dito sa Negros Panay Island natin yung mga organism dito at organism na makikita mo dito well for certain species at certain genus uh, more or less nagpo-form sila ng monopyletic lineages no Kasi nga, once before, once upon a time, they were connected into just one coalesced island. No? So yeah, may kita mong magkakamag-anak din pala yung mga species na nandyan. Mga species na nandyan. So ganun lang naman yung sinasabi ni Paik. Uh, Paik no? Na kapag during the Pleistocene time, parte sila ng isang coalesced island, more or less genetically similar, more or less related yung mga species na yan at more or less magpo-form yan ng monopyletic lineages. Okay ba? But of course, there are certain issues on that, no? There are distribution anomalies that questions that uh that please to seen uh, aggregation coalescence theory. So yeah, there are certain exceptions to the rule, if I may say. They are, there are what we call distribution anomalies. Say, for example, in northern Luzon, there is this one species of frog that can be found in northern Luzon and in the oceanic island of Tibuyan. But when you visit the uh, Pleistocene aggregated paleo, paleo island, Tibuyan was never connected to the greater Luzon. So why is that there is this frog species that can be found in Sibuyan and can also be found in northern Luzon? Where in fact, that frog species can never swim, no? It doesn't swim that far distances. So there are these uh, distribution anomalies that uh, remains enigmatic and questions the credibility of your Pleistocene I, uh, island complex. Some says that your Philippine island um, should be a what we call mini Sulawesi. Huh? So the Philippine island uh, could be proposed as a mini Sulawesi. No, it's the Sulawesi uh, right, right near us. No? Because recent studies on the distribution of your endemic flora and fauna in the uh, in the Philippines and in the Pleistocene aggregated island complex uh, shows that uh, there that the Paik does not explain you know, the Pleistocene aggregated uh, islands does not explain the entirety of the en high endemicity that we see in the Philippines high endemicity. It doesn't explain that much. So, uh, uh, scientists are now suggesting that the speciation, you know, the, the high species radiation, the speciation, and the radiation of multiple species that we see in the Philippines, say for example in small mammals and in some amphibians and reptiles, these patterns of radiation could be explained by uh, intra-island isolation or could be explained by sympathy. No? So it could be explained by sympatric speciation or intra-island isolation.
So yeah, those are the current uh, theory that we used for explaining the biogeographic uh, distribution of organism um, in the Philippines. Well, Pleistocene uh, aggregated island complex is the one theory that we use to explain such distribution distribution that we see in the Philippines. Okay, so yep, that's it for this lecture for today. I hope you gained a lot of insights from that and I hope you use this contextual knowledge that we have provided in terms of the Philippine context for your further growth in the academic industry. And without further ado, thanks for watching. Once again, this is Sir Patrick. Peace out.